Hey everyone, welcome back to Reboot GameSpot's Opinion Editorial Show. I'm Mike Mahardy. And I'm Jake Decker. And last week we published an episode called, Can Video Games Portray War Better? And surprisingly, it wasn't as contentious as we thought it was, but I think it was definitely our most critical one yet. Um, aside from the Mass Effect one, which was just kind of critical because I was down on Mass Effect. This was just more actually like, how can the wider genre, uh, sorry, medium of video games do better at portraying war? which they do often, but I don't think they do well. And we highlighted games we thought could do well, and we got a lot of questions in, so we'll jump right into those. Uh, thank you so much, as usual, in these off-week episodes, being a bi-weekly show, we like to, uh, I'd like to give Jake a chance to talk about the game or whatever we talked about last episode, because most of the time, this is my opinion. Uh, that might change in the future. We're working on those things. Um, but we did want to get right into questions. Thanks so much for your YouTube comments, your tweets. Uh, we have a few up here, so just jump right in. All right, first one is David Miller. He says, what are some story beats or gameplay mechanics that you guys think would make for a more realistic slash less sensationalized war game while also making for a fun video game? That's tough. Uh, this is really tough. Straddling the line between fun. I don't think I don't think it can be a, like an actual, right off the bat, I don't think any game is ever, it's never going to place us in war. There's no substitute for it. Even like VR will never actually place us into a place where we're afraid of dying and the shit that yeah. people at war have to see uh i didn't want to say that during that episode because i know that, that won't happen but uh in terms of a game because games kind of inherently have to be f they don't have to be fun uh which is actually what we want to we'll get into that but they kind of have to at least as a, a war game have like make use of the agency and may, whether that's like making it fun or that's actually like criticizing your actions like it did in spec ops which we touched on in the episode it's tough to straddle that line between entertainment and actual uh, realism. You know, like you know, like Arma and hardcore mods like that. I actually got into for a while, and then I couldn't because you really have to get into them. But I think those are the better ones. Where in terms of you actually have to manage like supplies, you have to manage uh, even like psychological stuff. I think XCOM and um, what else am I thinking? Fire Emblem. That's, they're kind of good about talking about the psychological impact on these people, like showing how in a strategy genre, not necessarily shooters, but these specific soldiers can panic or can be green, and it's gamified, but at least I'd like to see more on that, like the actual psychological effects of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think I agree with that, but I think when talking about mechanics, I think some things that could make them more interesting, I think is fragility of life, right? Like in games like Call of Duty, you seem to be able to take a lot of bullets and then you heal over time. Which is fine, that makes it fun, but I do enjoy those experiences where you really have to worry about getting shot. I mean, a recent game is Rainbow Six Siege. Headshots kill, one shot. Uh, and that's very different, that's a tactical shooter, but I think a war game could do something like that. Another idea that I actually just thought of on the spot here would be, there isn't really like a roguelike war game, really. And that could be kind of cool, you know, you die as one, come back, play yeah. as another one. Uh, coincidentally, did you ever hear uh, Hideo Kojima's idea for a game, he wanted to make a game back in the day, and I don't know if he actually pitched it to Konami, don't take my word for it, but go look this up. He wanted to make a game where if you die, the disc either, the disc like will stop working. Like it's permadeath <laughs> in, until you spend like whatever games were at that point, like a PS1 game was. And that sounds crazy, like it sounds cool. Like I guess like Arma, you're, it's kind of Yeah, permadeath. Arma is a good example. Um, but yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, but in terms of roguelikes, yeah, I mean, aside from like 2D platformers, that'd be really interesting to see people go yeah, kind of, uh, you know, start over and, like, actually portray in a realistic way and kind of make you really not want to die. Yeah, I, I think that would be a good mechanic to yeah. have an war game. Cool. Uh, next one is, does the fact that Walt Williams, who wrote Spec Ops, is writing Battlefront 2 uh, with Mitch Dyer? Does give that give hope? us hope? Does uh, that give you hope? Yes. That's actually, that's really cool. Um so Mitch Dyer knows his Star Wars really well, and he's a great writer. Um, we used to like kind of be colleagues with him when he was over at IGN, uh, but he's since joined EA Motive, and he's working on that with Walt Williams, who, like um, this person said, is very uh, well versed in, you know, maybe what we talked about in that episode uh, with Spec Ops kind of made you question your actions. So I don't know. They're they're doing the whole boots on the ground thing for Battlefront 2, but they're showing it from the Empire's pers perspective, which is cool, uh, and that's something we don't usually see in Star Wars and. You know, that could be that could be an interesting way to tackle the post Return of the Jedi pre Force Awakens conflicts. Yeah, when we were first discussing this episode, you we both brought up Spec Ops line, and you actually mentioned Walt Williams at the time too. And I think at the time, did we know he was actually working on Battlefront Two? 
Yeah, like tentatively. I didn't know like how many people were involved in writing it, but um, yeah, because I knew like once uh, Mitch Dyer had joined, I had heard that Walt Williams was also doing it too. Yeah, while writing this, I we definitely looked a lot at Spec Ops: The Line, and I think that is definitely one of the more powerful examples in the fact that he is working on Battlefront too, even though it isn't like a it's a Star Wars war game. I think that shows a lot of potential. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it in the war episode uh, last week's episode that. Just because Gears of War and Halo are science fiction doesn't mean that their stories are not, you know, commenting on real things. It's just yeah. like we talked to, uh, who did we talk to? It was, uh, it was Thomas Paine who wrote that book who uh, we looked up, uh, but or I had read for this episode and saying, you know, that just because there's not realism involved, that's like why Call of Duty went to the future because they were getting too much pushback and they were kind of like a political ramifications of, you know, the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq were becoming even more complicated by the day so like why the fuck are we portraying this in a video game and having you shoot these people when you're seeing this on CNN every day uh, I think that's why they went to the future and now they're going back to World War 2 which was a good time peg for this episode it turns out but um, yeah I I'm excited to see how Star Wars might be knowing Walt Williams past work and Mitch's past work I'm really excited to see how they apply Star Wars to, to like you know video games in general but also just what they could say with it yeah it gives them a really good opportunity to humanize the enemy possibly and kind of play with some of the moral the the, the moral things that the empire faces which you kind of don't really get much insight into it's like oh these are the bad guys they're doing bad things so yeah could could be interesting and yeah that last question was from uh john chukroon on twitter apologies if i'm completely butchering your name please uh respond to me on twitter after this episode let me know how to say it because we always appreciate your input um Last one we want to talk about today is more of a critique, which we always appreciate. Uh, Stephen Westcott on YouTube said, uh, may- Maybe you failed to mention Battlefield 1. Yes, it made war fun, but even more so, it portrayed the chaos and horrors of war. The soundtrack sets a somber and ominous tone to the events you're about to undertake. The weapons are frustrating and terrifying, and you can almost always get in a situation where you have no idea what's going on. I, I get where you're coming from. I disagree. I mean, that Italian campaign, you're waiting across this battlefield in this, like, pseudo suit of armor with a machine gun just mowing people down in the australian campaign you're this like lone wolf hero who yeah they try to humanize it with the kid who you're kind of recruiting but you're this australian messenger and you're a runner and you're you're going back and forth between these like all-out battles with these naval things uh the the actual american campaign they try to say stuff about like what it means to actually like sacrifice yourself and then you have a character next to you who doesn't want to do it I think they touch on it. I think Battlefield 1 glorified it more than any game I've played recently. I think Battlefield 1 made more war look good. Yeah, that opening intro, you're everybody's dying, but I get it. It was a pretty ham-fisted way to say it. It would say, like, uh, whatever, like, John Smith, 18, 18 years old or whatever. Yeah, like, I don't know, 1903 to 1918 or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, this, I think Battlefield 1 kind of purported to be uh humanizing and decrying war but i don't think it did that at all yeah i i think there for me at least there was definitely a disconnect between the story they were trying to tell and then what you actually would play and like what you were talking about the italian campaign the story for that i remember actually being kind of cool it was about this grandfather who finds memorabilia or something like that and then it kind of goes back in time and takes a look at takes a look at that and that idea is cool and they're talking about how war is hell essentially but then when you play it, yeah, you're in a suit of armor, you're mowing down things with a machine gun. It's it's a bit ridiculous. And once again, I think both of us, like, I, I enjoyed, I didn't play all the campaigns in Battlefield 1, but I played some of them and I did enjoy the ones I played, like the Australian one, the Italian one, um, and I, there's another one I played. And they were, they were all a lot of fun, but I think for what we were going for with this episode of Reboot, I just don't think Battlefield 1 really fit. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love Battlefield 1. I think it's a very fun game, multiplayer especially. But uh, like you said, I think you put it better than I did. They, there's definitely a weird juxtaposition between what they were telling you and what you were doing, for sure. <laughs> uh, but yes, anyway, Stephen Westcott, thank you for your input. And I appreciate your point of view. Like, even if we disagree, I, I completely wholeheartedly get why Battlefield 1 is impactful for a lot of people. So thank you very much for your comment. Um, anyway, I guess we could talk about what we're doing for the next episode of Reboot. Uh, yeah kind of you know catapulting from this episode we're gonna do one on do video games need to be fun and i'm sure there are gonna be a lot of comments just one word yes (laughs) but uh 
we're gonna dive into games that aren't necessarily made to be fun. Uh, I've got a few off the top of my head right now, but I don't want to spoil it. Um, you know, there probably people can probably guess a few we want to talk about in recent years, but um, I think more and more games don't always need to be made to be fun. They can just like convey something using player agency, and it's really interesting. I, I love fun games. Obviously, we just talked about Battlefield One. I had a lot of fun with that. I'm gonna probably play Titanfall Two later. I've been playing Persona Five, which is really fun for me. But I do want to look at what games can be outside of fun and I think it's a really important thing uh, especially when you want to take a deeper look at our medium which is that alone is fun but uh, can be helpful yeah what's interesting too is I don't know how much of the comments you looked through for this latest episode but that did get brought up someone was saying oh, cool. like uh, do games need to be fun like movies aren't always fun to watch yet they're good yeah I would never watch The Revenant again in my life yeah, uh, I mean, which we'll probably mention that in the next episode. <laughs> now that I say it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like not all. I think like the older a medium gets, the less it needs to just focus on being just entertaining or just fun. Uh, I think you can do more than that. I think games. You know, I'm not a crusader. I really enjoy fun games, but uh, I think games have a lot of potential to keep pushing the bounds of what they can be. But yeah, for everybody who got YouTube comments in, tweeted at us about last episode or suggested episode ideas for the future uh, or just critiqued or had questions, thank you so much. You're the best part of the show. We really enjoy these more laid back Q&A off week episodes. Um, but of course, we're going to get to work on the next episode and be sure, as always, to get YouTube comments, tweets in, uh, comments on GameSpot.com. We appreciate them and we always look forward to your insight. Until then, we'll see you next week.